Now we'll go through some updated needs and goals. So the modern goals of IBD management should be well known to this particular group, but I'll remind you that they include induction of what we are now terming deep remission, meaning turning off the inflammation and confirming it using biological measures, such as mucosal healing or laboratory values or growth and development. Maintenance of remission, which should be stable and optimize the therapy and the disease control and be steroid free. Uh, and the third major goal is prevention of complications. Um, monitoring for early relapse is a newer one, and cancer prevention. Our evolving principles that you've heard our colleagues discussing at this meeting, including um, incorporating elements of prognosis into the diagnosis in your early medical decision making, moving beyond one size fits all to smart therapy for the right patient, precision medicine, meaning optimization of treatments instead of guessing, and monitoring disease activity to achieve deeper remission and to anticipate flares. When you consider what is currently available, if we looked at our available therapies and they were used early and optimized in patients, we probably could have a much greater impact on the field. But the reality of it is not only do patients come to us for diagnosis late, but they also can come to us after being on therapies that are not working or are not being optimized. We certainly also recognize that there's a large primary non-response rate and a very large uh, ongoing challenge to loss of response over time. Not to mention that there are many patients in the world who have what we might consider to be IBD or will come to diagnosis later who we don't know about. So there's quite significant missed potential and that feeds into our understanding of the unmet needs of our patients. We don't achieve preferred outcomes in many of our patients because we either get to therapies that might be more impactful too late or the mechanisms clearly don't work or we're not optimizing either because we're under-treating, which is most often discussed, or maybe even over-treating in some situations, or we're focusing on the wrong problem, treating symptoms or a consequence of the disease rather than the inflammatory condition, uh, or we're still focusing more on symptom improvement and accepting that as being successful management. And this can be broken down into some of us call errors of commission, things we're doing wrong, versus errors of omission, things we're not doing enough or not doing at all. We certainly appreciate that therapies may not work because the mechanism doesn't work and maybe the diagnosis isn't clarified. It was actually Dr. Hanauer who taught me when I was a fellow that things really need to make sense. The significant symptoms a patient is having should match to the amount of disease you find and when they don't, you need to think carefully about why that may be. And then of course, the secondary loss of response, asking yourself, why did this happen? Is this attenuation of the therapy that's already working? Or has there been a new complication or infection that might be going on? And distinction between optimizing an existing therapy by adjusting dose or manipulating the pharmacokinetics versus changing mechanisms altogether. There have been a variety of studies that have tried to explore what's actually happening in the real world. This is a study that was published just this year looking at what we defined as suboptimal therapy. And what these graphs are showing you was what we defined as suboptimal therapy in claims data terms. And this is not meant to be a criticism of the doctors necessarily. Suboptimal also means we're just not getting where we need to be. And so what you're seeing there are the bars that look at patients who are either not sustained on a therapy once it's been started, or who need a disease-related surgery over time, or who end up switching therapies in a short interval, or who are maintained on steroids, which we accept as being um, an inappropriate way to manage these patients. So it happens quite often, as you can see, even without reading all the details. Corey Siegel shared this unique model of looking at claims data and understanding therapies that are being used. This is for Crohn's disease, and this is actually called a Sankey diagram, which was originally described for how uh, distribution of heating systems occurs. So you have the main trunk, and then it distributes throughout the, the building, or in, in the case of Sankey, it was actually ships. Um, when you look at medications, the size of the, the pipe 
represents how many patients are on the therapy uh, and then how it transitions over time to other treatments. And you see that for Crohn's, despite the fact that we're 10 years past the standard um, landmark step-up top-down strategy published in The Lancet, we're still seeing corticosteroids and 5-ASAs as our number one and number two therapies prescribed for Crohn's. And it doesn't get much better as you move along that pathway. So lots of room for improvement. We certainly could do this better by using our validated objective endpoints, understanding more about disease complications and disease risk over time, and working harder to optimize therapies to match the disease severity. A practical way to do that is what most in the room have heard of, which is called treating to a target. And the general consequence of treating to a target is that you're going to systematically reassess the disease, adjust your therapies in some algorithmic fashion until you either reach a target, run out of treatments, or you or the patient aren't comfortable escalating beyond that. The other important part of a treat to target that isn't talked about as often is after you reach your target, keeping the patient under close monitoring to know when they're starting to lose response or drift away. The targets for IBD have been defined in a variety of ways, and there was a consensus statement published in the Red Journal a couple years ago now suggesting that it should be a composite of both patient-reported outcomes and objective measures. So for both UC and Crohn's, it was resolution of the major symptoms of the condition, but combined with endoscopically confirmed remission, either through direct visualization or in this case of Crohn's, the possibility of cross-sectional imaging, which I would argue is not as easy to do, especially in the US, perhaps, as uh, it might sound. Things like CRP and CalPRO at the time of this consensus assessment were thought to be adjunctive, but I would say they're moving into the mainstream now with the presentation of the CALM study. So I've gotten us off to a start just to demonstrate why talking about novel therapies and how to position them is important, and there's a lot of room for us to continue improving, but also to drive home the point that with our existing therapies, there's much more that we could be doing as much as we need new treatments, and we're going to focus a little bit more about that as we now shift to talk more about biosimilars. And with that, I'm actually going to have uh, Shuchera come back up now and uh, tell us a little bit about the regulatory pathway for the biosimilar therapies to give us a background on understanding those drugs.